Hi, I'm Esben and uh, welcome to this video series on creating geodata and how to get geodata into ArcGIS. In the following I will talk about some of the common ways of creating geodata and um, their pros and their cons. I will especially be focusing on a special video on these that are not in italics or visual identification of objects and both in the field and in the office and unloading tabular XY data. Um, the ones that are in italics I will just cover briefly here to begin with because they are too large and do not fit into the format I'm working on at the moment. So, first of all, it's important to distinguish between two work situations. You can do field work, so um, collecting data in the field, or you can be sitting nice and comfortably in your office and creating data there. So that's two different situations that we should consider. Both can create new geodata. In the field, we often use a GPS tracker of some form. GPS tracker is basically a device, or a dedicated GPS device or a smartphone that locates you using the GPS satellites. Um, the smartphone has the advantage that it can also locate itself using the telephone network or uh, Wi-Fi networks. The disadvantage using GPS trackers is that they can only register the location where the device is. And that's fine if you are going to track animal movements or if you're going to track how people navigate through towns and that type of thing where it is the location of the device that is the input. If you are mapping things like danger zones or volcano eruptions and things like that, you might probably don't want to set be at the danger zone. So it might be a nice thing to stand outside the danger zone and then delimit it based on a, a visual identification. So GPS's, the disadvantage is that you have to be at the location itself or the device has to be. When using GPS tracking devices, you should also consider that there is most systems have a relatively limited battery power, especially if you're using smartphones. Modern smartphones have their primary design parameters on looking well and not weighing too much, and that typically is done by reducing the battery size. And GPS devices or GPS trackers have a tendency to be relatively heavy on the battery use and you should be check how long an operational time you'll get on that individual combination of one a phone and the app that you're using. There's big differences in the apps on how much, how heavy they are on the battery. But in general, the more interfaces, the more um, this is where you are showing it on the background of a map. The more it does of that type of thing, the heavier it is on the battery. So those that will run the longest are things that you start and they just run in the background with no user interface. They will typically last much longer than those that start up fancy maps and things like that. So if you're going to use your smartphone, test different apps to see which one um, meets your Need, uh, meet your, your needs. GPS receivers are typically don't have the most advanced user interface. So you can typically just put in a waypoint as a quote, which is the location. Um, there's two terms to be aware of here. There's a track, which is where the GPS has gone through time. And then there's waypoints, which is where you typically are allowed to enter a simple text such as this is where I observe this or that. And um, 
they typically don't have very smart keyboards so you will want to think about making small entries that do not need too many typings because that takes a long time on the GPS device. So GPS devices, handheld GPS devices um, can be used for doing registration of uh, waypoints or points and lines um, and you can enter data but the data entry is not very efficient. You should also be aware that if you're using GPS devices for long time tracking, so more than 48 hours, you'll probably have to consider buying some relatively expensive equipment because most of the cheaper versions, they will only last 48 hours, 24 hours. Um, so be aware of the battery life if you're going to track, do long time trackings. So that was GPS and smartphones as just simply using them to track locations. Another thing I will not talk about in this is um, the use of survey equipment, total stations. So these are advanced equipment that can do measurement of angles and distance and modern ones can do it automatically. They can scan an object and count from a specific location, calculate angles and distances and they do it with sub-millimeter precision. So for things like doing um, profiling of streams, measurement of looking at dangers of uh, landslides and things like that, well, that's the type of equipment that you'll be looking at. Um, but they typically need a wee bit more training than just watching a video. So. Um, I will not talk about them, we have them and um, at the university and if you need to use this type of equipment I'm more than happy to give you a um, tutorial on using total station, um, these total stations, or yeah, survey equipment. The thing that we will be focusing on is doing what I've called visual identification of objects using image data. It, in the field work, this is probably the one that we do the most common way of doing it as geographers. That is that we are on a piece of paper, that's a classical version, so we will print out an aerial photograph or a map, go into the field, and using a pen, we will delimit the objects that we are interested in. So here we have a hedgerow of this, or the hedgerows on these maps have been removed, or here we have a pond, or here we have whatever. And then filling in some data forms. Um, and that's a process that we've been, geographers have been using for centuries. Um, modern technology has uh, enabled us to use tablets or smartphones. So going into the field using one of these devices makes um, the process not of registering it much easier, but the process of loading the data afterwards much easier. So basically, um, we can have a uh, application running on our smartphone or our tablet, and um, we can then do our delimitation of our objects on that application and enter some attribute data. Compared to um, the GPS receiver, they typically have a much nicer user interface and especially they have this ability that you can enter data that you are not, it's not necessarily the GPS location. GPS can help you locate yourself and then you can either manually or using a range finder or some other advanced equipment identify the object without having to go exactly and stand on top of the object that you're identifying. So visual identification in the field using uh, some form of image, map or air photograph is a very efficient way of doing data collection. And we will, in a later video, be talking specifically about using the application that comes, that SV has developed also. So the Arc Collector, which is a application that you can run um, and will automatically generate 
the data, um, save the data to um, a server from which you can get the data. So we'll cover that in a later video. In the office, we also do a lot of, um, of data creation. Um, we can either, as in the field, sit in front of a aerial photograph or typically a scanned historical map and then do data delimitation they are saying, okay, here in 1860, this is where we observed we had forests and so on. So data identification on using imagery is also a common approach as office work. If um, you are doing work in a larger group, you might have people that do not have GIS experiences. And I have had lots of good experiences using Google Earth, so giving saying asking people to generate the data in Google Earth and then loading the data back as KML ChemSet files um, which was covered in another video so you can see how that is done but that is a typically efficient way if you want to do data collection together with people that do not have GIS experiences. You can also do uh, classification of data so um, typically that would be satellite data and you can then run some form of classification routines. Our GIS has a dedicated toolbar for this, uh, Image Classifier, where there's a series of tools for doing automatic or semi-automatic uh, image classification. Typically, again, this is you need more than the free channels of um, an aerial photograph. You probably buy five or six channels to do appropriate um, classification algorithms but that's there uh, and um, I will not talk about that in this video but there might be another video on that and finally there is loading of tabular data XY coordinates um, there's lots of historical records where the location is registered um, archaeological digs and finds or whatever they will typically have registered the location, not because they said for the use of it in the GIS, but to be able to go back and find that location in the field. And this type of data will be available as XY data. And um, the process of loading XY data also cause, covers lots of modern data sets that generate XY data. So you can get quite a lot of um, situations where you'll be loading XY data in order to get um, data into ArcMap.